My name is Donna Marie Emmert, and I'm the staff assistant coordinator for our Seed Saver Library. And I would like to welcome you to the Washington County Public Library and Sunday with Friends. I'd also like to welcome Spring. Yay! Timely author could be invited to speak this afternoon than our guest, Janice Ray. Uh, it's been too long since we've seen her here in Washington County. The last time that I'm aware of that she was here was she was our featured writer during the Virginia Highlands Festival way back in 2002, uh, featuring her first book, Ecology of a Crack of Childhood. Uh, since then, she's gone on to much larger audiences and to acclaim, much higher acclaim well-deserved acclaim. Um, likened to Rachel Carson. Uh, Janice Ray with the publication of her newest book, this one right here, To Seed Underground, A Growing Revolution to Save Food, finds her fame growing. <laughs> this is a tough crown. <laughs> Yeah, okay. <laughs> the Seed Underground has won the Nautilus Gold Book Award, uh, Better Books for Better World in Green Living, American Horticulture Society Book Award, uh, and Gardeners Writers Association Gold Award for Achievement. Yeah, these are just to name a few. It is also the first book chosen for our new Seed Savers Library Book Club. I know that's a mouthful. I'll come up with a better name later. Uh, meeting on April 7th, if anybody would care to join us here. Um, today, of course, you'll be able to buy a copy of this book if you would like to and have it autographed. Or you can also check one of these out here in our library. Uh, in this book, Janice makes one very salient point. We are losing our seeds. And our quest for easier, more convenient, more right now, we have ignored the very things that sustain us. Civilizations have collapsed because of less. Janice Ray has used her voice and uses her voice both in person and in print to champion the longleaf pine, the okafenoki, yes, swamp, and global warming. She's now leading a quiet revolution to lead people back to the earth, back to the gardens, one tomato or one bean at a time. So what I have to say is this. Viva la Revolution, viva the Janice Ray. If you haven't heard what's happening with seeds, let me tell you, they're disappearing about like everything else. You know the story already. You know it better than I do. The fish in the ocean, Appalachian Mountains, the songbirds. But I'm not going to talk about anything that will make us feel hopeless or despairing because there's no despair in a seed. There's only life waiting for the right conditions, sun and water, warmth and soil to be set free. Every day, millions upon millions of seeds lift their two green names. Thank you all so much for giving up this gorgeous afternoon to come sit in the library and talk about seeds and gardens. And I promise, I did a reading one time in which uh, my husband was selling books afterwards. And so as soon as I was done, he rushed to the bathroom before he headed to the book table. And there was another gentleman who had gotten there at the same time. They were both standing at urinals. And the other gentleman said, when will speakers learn that the brain can only absorb what the butt can tolerate. <laughs>
And so what you see is uh, uh, another apocalyptic loss of, of diversity. In this case, agrodiversity. Uh, the story is actually much worse than what they found and not so bad as, as what it seems. So what they found is there are available on in the markets right now about 7,500 open pollinated varieties. So if you're going to save your seed, you're going to have to save a, high, a, a variety that's not a hybrid, not hybridized and not genetically modified. So these are called open pollinated or open source seeds, meaning you plant this okra, and what you get back from it is exactly the same okra. So you go, <laughs> the cycle of life continues over and over. You guys know this. There were about 7,500 in 1900, about 7,500 in 2000. So if 94% are gone, what is the new, what, where are the new 94% coming from? They're coming from plantsmen like you guys, stalking the hollows and the plains, finding old heirloom seeds and bringing them back to the marketplace. They're also, that 94% is also new varieties brought to this country from like a new watermelon from Iraq, a, 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 a new pumpkin from Ghana. And the third thing is that we still have plant breeders in the United States who are breeding in the traditional way, who are growing out, who are not releasing F1 hybrids, but are growing out seeds until you can save them yourselves, and they become part of the great commons again. However, what is not shown in that study are people like my grandfather, Arthur, who grew a seed corn for all of his farming life, every year uh, collecting two or three, four ears of it, shelling them off, putting them in coffee cans on a back shelf, and that was his planting material for the next year. When, when hybrid corn was introduced in America, my grandfather, like every other, most every other farmer, decided that he wanted a corn that was resistant to, a ba to bacterial will, and he too stuck that garden seed on a back shelf and went down to the feed and seed hardware store uh, for, his, for his seed crop. That means that thousands upon thousands of varieties across America never made it to the marketplace. A seed begins to adapt in one generation in your garden. That means if you've been growing a seed for even a couple of years, it, has, it is on its way to becoming genetically unlike any other seed available. Happily adapted to your growing conditions, your microclimate. All right, I, I'm not gonna lecture at you the whole thing. You know what happened with seeds. What it means to us is a loss to our plates and our palates. Uh, if I take you to my garden right now and I feed you lacinato kale, dwarf blue curled kale, and uh, green peace kale, which is a Georgia heirloom that is of the red Russian variety and has red stems and stalks, every one of those kales tastes differently. The kashaw that my grandmother grew which was the first seed I ever saw anybody saving when I was a very young girl, about six years old, tastes incredibly differently than Waltham butternut squash or red curry or any other squash you can find. Uh, I now grow, um, I grow gold striped kashal, which is a, uh, a sport <coughs> or a mutation of green striped kashal. But this is exactly the seed that my grandmother was growing. It tastes different because it has a different nutritional profile. So we, I, I believe that in all, you know, I'm a nature writer. In fact, let me just read you this one little thing here. When we, when the USDA looks at the nutritional profile of kale, for example, and finds it has this much percentage of vitamin A, not every kale has 20% vitamin A. Some are going to have more, some are going to have less. So what happened was with the so-called Green Revolution, I, I believe a very misnamed revolution, we began to breed seeds for industrial production. 
for beauty on the supermarket shelves, for shipability, for their ability to ripen all at the same time so we could go in and pick a field of watermelon. And we lost so many varieties of seeds that we were growing for nutrition or for specialized uh, craft artisanal food products that we were making. So it's a loss to our plates and to our palates. It's a loss of control over seeds right now. Three quarters of seeds globally are owned by multinational corporations, right? Mostly by three multinationals, DuPont, Syngenta, and Monsanto. Monsanto. <laughs> God, I almost forgot. <laughs> that one. How could you? I know. <clears throat> All right, what am I missing? And the third thing, it, the third loss is a loss of agrodiversity. That we could have lost 94% of, uh, of the diversity of our, of our food supply. So when we lose control over seeds and we lose seeds themselves, we lose our ability to feed ourselves. So that's why I, I think I wrote this book for two reasons. Hold on, let me see if I can just find this quickly. Because it's right here. Sometimes I dreamed, sometimes I dream a tree birthed me. I came tumbling like an apple out of its limbs. I came to a causeway and looked out across my father's and mother's faces, which were shining in the sun like the gulf. I saw many beautiful things. I saw love in the eyes of deer. I saw the throats of lilies moving. And I wanted a farm. I wanted a farm at the border of wilderness. I could not escape this terrible yearning. Even as I was becoming a nature writer, seeking wildness and spending halcyon days walking through the remaining tracks of Longleaf Pine, I battled a piece of myself that was happiest not on wilderness but on a farm. I had come to think of a societal continuum moving that begins with wildness on one end, hunting and gathering for food, moving through agrarianism, that's settling down and tending a piece of land, then through industrialism, which is an urban life, on into technologism, whatever you want to call it, and whatever that lifestyle is. So a tract of land then can contain a forest, or a farm, or a manufacturing plant, or a bank of computers operated by robots. If wildness was on the left of the continuum, I wanted land use, all movement in terms of land use to be from right to left, always toward wildness. But though my hope for land is that it tends toward wild, the truth is that I am probably happiest somewhere in the middle. My friend Rick Bass once said to me, what I would want after working in the fields would be to step away from the plow and enter an old forest where I could walk and rest at the end of a day of hard work. So as a nature writer, for so many years, uh, ecology having been published 15 years ago, exactly right now, I saw a lot of hopelessness. I saw a lot of lost tracts of land, a, a lot of lost I issues that ended just absolutely in grief. And after a while, I realized that as I went off to libraries and bookstores and colleges to speak, the things that the students were asking, and the young people especially, but also us old people, were not, can we bring back the red wolf? Is the ivory-billed woodpecker really extinct? Can we restore the Everglades? Can we connect the Yukon to the Yellowstone? The questions are, can we start a community garden on campus? Can we start a farmer's market here? Can we get Cisco? Uh, the contractor for our cafeteria, to start buying a whole cow and not these, you know, ground up chemical hamburgers? Those were the questions. And I realized that in my own hopelessness and periods of hopelessness, that, the, that I wanted to write a book about something that I feel completely hopeful about. I'm not abandoning my love of nature with this book. I'm really returning to something that I loved before there was nature writing in my life. The 
pre the preface is about a page long, and I want to read it to you. I'm standing under the saddest oak that ever was. A young man who as a child climbed this very tree has died, fallen from a balcony during a party. For his memorial service, there are no pews, altar, or casket. A circle of friends and family congregate in the yard of his grieving mother, my friend. One tattooed man, about 25, remembers how his buddy helped him through bouts of depression. Another young man behind me steps forward to speak, stumbles, and throws his arm around my waist. His eyes are bloodshot, and he breathes out small alcoholic clouds. He steadies himself and delivers a small poem, words scribbled large in blue ink. This man is the age of my son, as could be any of them, young people searching for beauty and meaning, struggling to understand the events of the epoch. They are so young to be so familiar with grief. We could be holding a funeral for the Gulf, this happened right after the oil spill, or for the climate, or any number of things. <clears throat> I feel around me a cavernous hopelessness, but I do not feel hopeless. Many systems we have been collectively living amid and on which we rely appear to be failing. The easiest thing to do is give up, but so much needs to be done, every mind and body crucial for putting new systems in place. We don't need people to drop out. On the way home from that service, I was listening to Bluegrass when I heard this question, what will you be doing when you're called away? This book is for everyone, but it's especially for you young people in hopes that given all the bad, you start building. Not skyscrapers or oil rigs, but lives that make sense, that contribute to a lighter, more intelligent, more beautiful way of living on the earth. Lives lived as far outside and beyond corporate control as possible. And in doing so, you find meaning, that you attain higher planes before drugs or alcohol enslave you, that you inhabit the country of love, that you find happiness. Here in the country, on a little farm in southern Georgia, I am building a quiet life of resistance. I am a radical peasant, and every day I take out my little hammer and I keep building. Seeds are only a small part of life but they represent everything else, all my relations. I think with the good food movement, we understand that organic food is healthier for us because chemical food is killing us. I think we understand that about local food, that food grown closer to home is more nutritious and therefore healthier. And also that it supports our neighbors, the people growing that food. But I think the time has come to understand what's happening to seeds. That we're losing seeds, we're losing our control over seeds, and we are losing these beautiful, well-rounded uh, menus. I want to read to you just one chapter today. It's kind of a funny chapter called Winning the Must of Province. And um, I want to leave a little bit of time for questions and then end with a page or two from the very last chapter, okay? Dusk has come and gone. Can everybody hear me? Dusk has come and gone by the time I get to the pumpkins, and I would ignore them and go inside, clean up and eat. The time is after nine, except I must seize an opportunity. A bloom will open in the morning, and I cannot let the bees get to her before I do. I take a flashlight and masking tape to the garden and search the wild, wildly sprawling vines for an inflorescence. This vine has many flowers in all stages, and I'm looking for a particular one, a female, set to open in about 12 hours. Between the flower and the stem is a miniature fruit, a miniature pumpkin to be. Up and down the vine, beneath the large, rough, white-spotted leaves, Male flowers prepare to open. Then I spot the female. I kneel down beside her, angling the light. Mosquitoes zero in quickly in circles, snarling legion because of the rains. I slap at them as I tear masking tape and fold it over the blossom, shutting it tightly. I mark the blossom with a ripped length of blue cloth. Full 
story. I was introduced to it at a small festival in the tiny village of Wardsboro, Vermont. The Gill Feather Turnip Festival celebrates this turnip, developed through hybridization by John Gill Feather on a hillside farm in Wardsboro in the early 1900s, which, by the way, had to have been the heyday of food diversity in this country. 7,000 varieties of apple trees, and now you go to the grocery store and you find Yellow Delicious, uh, Red Delicious, Granny Smith, Gala, and even some of those. Was, we're, we're even actually uh, transitioning out some of the varieties that we grew up with. This festival is sponsored by the Wardsboro Friends of the Library who sell packets of gill feather seed, locally designed t-shirts, and handmade gill feather cookbooks. During the tasting hour, the year I was there, I sampled caramelized turnips, turnip cake, turnip bread pudding, <laughs> turnip soup, turnip omelet, turnips with cheddar cheese, turnip quiche. As I had entered a large jar, a large glass jar at the registration table had been filled with chocolate kisses. Whoever came closest to guessing how many kisses were in the jar, a sign said, would win a pumpkin. Which pumpkin, I asked a library volunteer. That one, she said. She pointed out one in a pile. The pumpkin was as large and beautiful as a wheel of cheese. It was smooth but deeply ridged, the color of apricots. It would easily make a dozen pies. I decided I was going to win that pumpkin. <laughs> Is it okay to count the kisses that I can see through the glass? I asked the volunteer. If you can see the candy, it's fair game, she said. Counting is allowed. Without touching the jar, I counted the kisses lying across the top. I counted approximate layers of kisses from top to bottom. I did some figuring. The jar was not perfectly cylindrical about this time. The wider layers would have at least 12 extra kisses, and nine layers, more or less, were wider. I added 108 kisses for the wider layers and figured some more. What I've noticed about speculation is that guesses are usually too low. I cringe to think what this says about we humans, maybe that we're chronic underestimators. So I added 100 kisses to my total, wrote my guess on a piece of paper, Stuck my vote in the cardboard box and turned on my hope machine. <laughs> Did you see the pumpkin I'm going to win? I asked my husband, who was upstairs. When I talk like that, he believes me. He still thinks I'm magic. <laughs> no, let's go see it, he said. I showed him the jar of kisses and the pumpkin. He reached for a slip of paper. What was your guess, he said. I'm not telling, and there's no need for you to bother guessing. I've won already. <laughs> he scribbled on his paper, folded it, and slipped it through the slot of the box. I want that pumpkin, I said. I'm going to save the seeds. Have you ever seen anything like it? Can't say I have. At the end of the day, when volunteers counted the kisses, there were 891 in the jar. All right, you guys remember that? Sweet, I thought. I'm very close. The workers fidgeted through the entries while I watched more nervously than I was willing to admit, even to myself, and they determined that the winning guess was 875, okay? They sent someone off looking for the winner. My guess was not 875. The pumpkin would not be living at my house. Then I did the math. Excuse me, I said. I think you'll find another guess in the pile that's closer. <laughs> 901. I was shocking myself at how greedy I'd become. <laughs> but it was an unusual and enthralling pumpkin. No, a volunteer said, 875 was the closest. I always think my accent may be a liability in situations such as this. Southerners stereotyped as slow because of our speech. Remember, I was in Vermont. <laughs> but one time I was in Sitka, Alaska, and I got just handsomely lost. And I stopped this guy on the street and, I, and asked him where I was. And he, he didn't answer my question. He just turned and looked back down at me, really shocked, and he said, what, did you just fall off the turnip truck or something? <laughs> In a way, I did. <laughs> my guess was 901, I said. I could see energy finally reach a light bulb behind her eyes. The volunteers had not thought of guesses exceeding the correct figure. The rule is the closest guess, right? I said, not the closest that's less than. I could be 
is such a butthole sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. The library ladies re-examined the guesses and found 901. They confabbed. By this time, someone had located the fabled winner among the crafts on the second floor and had brought him downstairs. Uh, one of the women said, it looks as if we've made a mistake. Hold on just a minute. Is this you? She asked me. Did you guess 901? I did, I said. That's how I knew it was in the box. <laughs> well, that's definitely closer, she said. Yes, ma'am. She turned to the non-winner, for whom I had zero sympathy. <laughs> we are so sorry, she told the man. We made a mistake. The man, who looked newly retired, was gracious. It's not a problem, he said. He had the friendliest face, which is what signaled some angel in me to emerge. Well, you can have the prize, I said, if you really want it. Young lady, what would I do with a pumpkin like that, he said. <laughs> oh, thank you, I said. Why was I thanking him? I won the damn thing. <laughs> Southerners. <laughs> I planned to set it on the butcher block in my kitchen and photograph it and wish that I had grown it. I planned to tell the turnip festival story a hundred times. I planned to wait until the last possible hour next spring to cook it, maybe even until a rotten spot appeared on it. I was smitten with the whimsicality, me winning this incredible pumpkin by guessing 901 chocolate kisses in a jar. What variety is it? I asked the aides. Oh, the squash farmer told us. We have the name written down somewhere, one replied. Squash farmer? All she grows are squashes. Here's the name, another said. Must have promised. The name made no sense to me, and after I lugged the pumpkin home, I promptly forgot what it was called. A few weeks later, I moved it to our cool basement where it lasted a year without spoilage before I baked it into fabulous pies. I saved the seeds, but because its grower was a squash farmer, I were doubtful they were pure, meaning true to type. So just, just a little tiny bit of biology here. Those big, beautiful flowers of squash, you know, that you can eat, the flowers, they evolve to attract insects. That's why they're so big and colorful and beautiful, all right? So they're insect pollinated. So, so they're basically four... Uh, species, genus of squash, and if you are planting two or three from the same, is it species? From the same species, they're going to cross, which is why if you save your zucchini seed and you were growing yellow squash at the same time and the bees were visiting one and taking pollen over here and leaving some, you may get zucchini, green zucchini with yellow dots, yellow squash that's straight and green, you know what I mean? You're going to get any number of the historic parental lines uh, of those. So this uh, hand pollinating, which is what I'm telling you about in this chapter, is a way of keeping the seed pure. How I wanted to grow such charismatic, long-lasting, delectable pumpkins. I needed three things. The name, to know if it was an open source variety, and seeds. It just so happened that the next fall I attended Common Ground Fair a huge outdoor organic ag show in Maine. I spotted by chance a pumpkin of the same variety in the um, exhibit hall. Musk, it was labeled Musk, M-U-S-Q-U-A, Musk de Provence. That was it. When I got home, I ordered seeds. Now they've grown into an insouciance of vines and I am determined to produce pure ones. I finished taping shut the last male flower to prevent a wayfaring insect from haplessly contaminating the moose that provokes his pollen with some other kind. That night, just before falling asleep, I remind myself to pollinate the flower, the female flower, early the next morning. I sleep and I dream that I'm taking care of a little girl. I find a goose egg and I'm showing it to her when she drops it and it bursts, spilling a curdled yellow liquid that doesn't smell rotten. Then a small mother bird falls out of the shell, wet and unready for the world, followed by a baby bird, very tiny, swaddled in bits of hay. The two birds flounder on the floor. I wail softly, oh no, no attempting to gather up the birds so that although born immature, both of them, I might save their lives. 
The mother tries desperately to escape me, and as I cop her against a wall, she becomes a Luna mom. Somewhere during the dream, my erratic breathing wakes my husband. He says I've been holding my breath for 10 to 15 seconds at a time. Next morning, I gently strip off petals and rub male anthers full of pollen onto the stigma of the female. Then I retake the female and wait. In a few days, I see that the pollination is successful because the basically the rest of the blossom withers and drops away and the fruit begins to enlarge. Over the weeks and months to come, I keep vigil, watching, and turning the pumpkin. I prop it on a board to keep ants and beetles from chewing on it. When it matures, I will scoop out its seeds and dry them. I will give them to friends. I will grow more. I may even become a squash farmer myself. <laughs> Winning the list of problems. All right. the home of my good friend Steve and Chris Lindemann, they had a packet, this is a, uh, it's So True Seed labeled this packet, but they encourage people to save seed, so you fill out what it is. It's supplied by Holly Knob, which is what they call their home, up in Hyder's Gap, and the variety is Zucca Lunga di Napoli. Oh! Y'all know this? No, we're growing. We're the first that grew. Y'all gave them that seed? You guys, there's a picture of, of Steve. This thing is like this long. Like, I mean, like seriously, you're lugging it like that. Okay, there's probably 25 seeds in here. If somebody has to have a few, I'll show oh. They're all in their cards. I'd love to. What did you say? They're all in their cards when they go out. They were supposed to be four Supposed to be. And then he went out. You wouldn't believe. Sixty pounds. Sixty pounds. Oh my gosh. Our, that big one of ours was about fifty pounds. So I learned the same lesson that Anthony did. So it took me a while to figure out who they came from, you know, because they came from a friend who I'd forgotten who brought them. We were having a party at our house, and somebody showed up with this beautiful origami. A seed packet that they had made themselves out of wax paper and written the variety on there in kind of sketchy handwriting. And I thought it was somebody else, and it took me a while to track it down. And I finally went to market one day and I said, Anthony, because I remember him having no squash at market. And the wow. problem with him is, is he will attest, nobody's going to buy a squash. No. The way they <laughs> and even if you charge 50 cents a pound, nobody's going to buy it. So he grew them once. The seed oh, made its way to me, and I grew them once. Yeah. And yeah. I've been giving the seed away. It's going to <laughs> yeah. I, I grew out a bunch of plants, thinking that they were Italian heirloom zucchinis. And I gave away a bunch of these plants. And then I had to very quickly go back and tell people, because we had friends that had small urban gardens. And I said, look, this thing is going to be like, going to take over your life. <laughs> and I had this one that grew, the one this plant only set the only fruit. And I kept it. I put it on a basket and kept it and got bigger. But they are not coming through the seed because I have other plants and they're there's some of them that are shaped like a beautiful green pumpkin. And there's some that are oval shaped and there's some that are small and some that are big. And if you go online and look the variety up, there's a fair amount of variety in the variety, I think. Well, good thing that we have, um, you know, plant selectivity, selection, what do you call it? Plant so, because you can get back what it's supposed to be. Even if it crosses, you can just keep choosing, you know, keep selecting for the traits that you know. <laughs> Does anybody have a question or a comment? Yes, you mentioned Monsanto. Monsanto. Well, I think it's in Colorado where they do the research and development. But the people that uh, work in there, they have a cafeteria, and they refuse to eat their own products. Mm -hmm. They go to the company where we're not eating this crap. Oh. It's from outside and stuff. Yeah, wow. We know what's in here. Yeah. Uh, I'm really concerned about the number of states that have laws restricting the seed. In fact, I was reading an article just the other day uh, where the state of Alabama got it right, which is unusual. I grew up there and I used to be embarrassed 
been doing really long. But if farmers can can um, exchange three thousand for three thousand pounds of seeds, or give away or sell three thousand pounds of seeds without having to have any sort of certification. And I was reading there were several other states. I mean, there was like this intergalactic association of seed inspectors or something. And there's actually an association that goes around and you know, makes sure you don't have to you know, do any exchange. Yeah. I, I'm a little bit of a conspiracist about everything, just warning you. But I, I believe that the, the end result of this line of thinking is going to be to take control of our food supply. And I, I know that's kind of a radical fall, but that's why I believe what you're doing here at the library, which is you started a seed library, you know, you can go up there today and get six free packs of seeds at the end of the season if you have some success with your zinnia or whatever bring some back i mean i think that's exactly what has to happen is just take back control of our of our seeds as much as possible yeah so the the question exactly was do i know about these states laws that limit uh, seed exchange and i know very little about it i do know that one seed library in pennsylvania was shut down for a brief period of time and it's now reopened again and that um i just i don't know i don't i just don't even worry about that just do what you need to do keep growing keep passing around seeds and let their laws catch up with us if they can <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um you mentioned that the the seed stock of course, is, is uh, being withered down to develop attri attributes for, for uh, growing time and for packing and I guess for making a square apple so it fits in the box better or whatever. Is there anything you can say about these new seed varieties that are coming out that's positive? Are there, are there, do they have some attributes that are better by oh. virtue of disease resistance? Or drought tolerance. Is this yeah, process going on too? That's fat. That's a great question. And you are absolutely one hundred percent correct. That some of the new varieties have, you know, for example, we're we're now uh, producing tomatoes, most of which are hybrid, of course, that are resistant to wilt, fusarium wilt, which is a horror if you're trying to grow tomatoes on land that tobacco was grown on, yeah. you're gonna have a really hard time growing organic tomatoes. So, exactly, but I also believe that you, if you are a plant breeder worth your salt, you will be breeding for the great commons. I believe that some things are owned by all of humanity. The air, the water, fire, you know? I don't think that you should go into a spring and drag up the water and sell it in plastic bottles to people. I don't believe that, and, I, and so I believe that seed ought to be part of the great commons of life. And that the seed breeder should continue his or her work if you just go on seven to 10 generations and stabilize that F1 cross. Uh, it gets a little complicated here. Then you will have an open source seed. So that's what I believe. Yes, there are some. Now, it, we're, we're gonna get into genetic modification in just a minute here because we're being sold this line that genetic mod modification is going to be the only thing that feeds the world. Well, my personal belief is that agriculture as we know it is monstrously broken. And the only thing that is going to save the world, feed the world, is going to be a return to the agriculture that our, my grandfather knew and your grandfather and grandmother knew. It wasn't that long ago. I mean, the so-called Green Revolution is only the 40s. So my thinking is that the new agriculture is going to be the only thing that saves us. Because uh, one, for example, is that we are hiding all kind of costs in how we grow food. So if our food is more and more, Don Davis, a researcher at the University of Texas in Austin, now retired, he did a study in which he looked at USDA nutrient values 50 years ago and now, basically now. And they, the values of minerals, nutrients, phytonutrients, vitamins decrease across the board in all of our commercial food. 
mainly it's because it's how we're growing food that we pay attention to three main chemicals in agriculture. Uh, what the new science, the new agronomists are finding out is that we also have to pay attention to magnesium. Magnesium is a hugely important mineral in the human body to prevent heart attacks, to keep people calm. There are just hundreds and hundreds of things that it does. No mineral or vitamin in your body works unless it has a supply of magnesium. Magnesium is like the, the energy, it's the electricity. And yet, most of our food is grown magnesium poor. So, I think that chemical agriculture has hidden the real travails and costs. And, and, and so when I say that organic ag is going to be the only thing that works, I mean because so much of that is hidden from us. And the damage to the land, the damage to the water, the damage to the human body. Look, Roundup is glyphosate. Roundup, so many of these genetically modified uh, uh, organisms were bred or were created to be resistant to Roundup. So the amount of pesticides and herbicides that we're now spraying on our crops has increased. I think in the first 10 years it was like 93 million more tons of, of herbicides were being put on our, our crops. So. I don't know if y'all want to go into that, but <laughs> glyphosate lasts 40 years. Glyphosate is connected with all these autoimmune dis di uh, immune diseases that were all that are manifesting in all of us, including autism, Parkinson's disease, Lyme disease, all of them, asthma across the board. Something in the way we are eating is is uh, turning off some of our detox processes in the body. It's extremely complicated. I don't understand it. All I know is that I adopted my little half niece three years ago who was traumatized and has some of these issues. She had the inability in her body to detox um, heavy metals, chemicals, glyphosate. And so when she was tested for these, her behavior was just off the chart crazy. And she tested high for uh, mercury. Now you're getting mercury, mercury is a neurotoxin and there are many ways that we all get mercury, including in food. Um, so one of, the, one of the ways that a lot of autistic parents are reclaiming, recovering autistic children is low dose chelation of heavy metals. Mercury, lead, barium, and that's actually, it. we've tried many, many healing modalities with our daughter, and that is the only thing that's worked. So we also try to eat as organically as possible. I live on a farm where our mission is for, to provide as much of our own food as possible. And like we would like to pr produce 100% of our food. Before our little girl arrived, I would say we were probably, 75% of the food that we ate came from our own 46 acres. And now, we spend so much time with her, I'd say it's more like 50%. We take a, we will often take a picture of our plate before we eat it. And it's just everything on there. So right now, for example, we're eating a lot of, our collards are growing uh, to seed. And the collard seed head is like a broccoli seed head. You know, like right before the flowers open or even after the flowers open, it starts to get tough. So we eat for breakfast almost every morning is um, sautéed onions and collard shoots, collard flowers mixed with eggs. But we also, the day I was leaving, my husband was making a sausage out of a, a lamb and a goat that had to be processed. So I didn't mean to answer that. <laughs> you mentioned glyphosate, and it connects to the, the a speaker we had at Emory and Henry last fall. Lincoln Brower uh, spoke about yeah, the monarch, about butterflies, yeah, and um, the monarch populations of the U.S. down ninety percent in twenty five years or something. Yeah, uh, that's horrific. And um, but a friend of mine said, "Well, I'll just have to be honest. Uh, do we do we need monarchs?" 
and I wanted, uh, wanted what you would say on the question. It's a question about the value. You that question. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you say when someone says that? I say, do we need you? <laughs>
And then it goes on, you know, grow a garden, put in a container, try to, let's see, become a farmer, become a young farmer, never grow GM seed, learn to breed seed, become a seed activist, start a seed library. And it just goes on, work at the local level to pass laws that prohibit, you know, like if you're, if the, if the muni muni municipalities in Alabama or in Georgia can get to the laws before the legislature does, then you can pass laws that subvert whatever massive laws they pass. So anyway, there's a whole list there. But I, I think your question, I, I interviewed a seed saver, Sylvia DeVox, for this book. And she said, she said, the system is so broken. I didn't ask her what kind of system she means because I personally believe that there is a lot of broken systems. The political system is fairly broken, the agricultural system. I just listened to her. She said, I see in activism a kind of utility. The real action is in making the broken system irrelevant. The real action is in living as far outside the broken system as you can. And that, I believe, my friends, is why people are so hopeful about the good food movement. Because it, because it is one easy place where you can opt for industry and corporate control, corporations not to control you. All right, we're gonna get yours. Is that okay? Am I ready or are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> Hurry. I'll, I'll let you pass on this. It's a big issue, but I wondered if you could tell us anything about what the Norwegians are doing up above the Arctic Circle on their um, seed bank. Yeah, the, the Svalbard. Um, so collecting seeds from around the world and putting it in this, you know, in this uh, mountain, uh, uh, a reinforced mountain of, uh, in the permafrost. And, but there, it's not just the Norwegians. They're actually collecting seeds from around the world. Seed Savers Exchange has sent boxes and boxes of seeds there. But they're there. doing it. Aren't they the Norwegians? Aren't they the ones it's on Norwegian are... land. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly right. Why are they doing it? Now that's a question for you. Uh -huh. Because why would you do it? You would do it because there may be some huge catastrophe coming in which you would need all the genetic resources possible. And that's really the only answer to that question. Yeah. Is there some smart, forward-looking people? They are. And they've got a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> I want one more time to remind you of the most powerful thing in the world. It's a seed. In this era of transition between the age of industrialization and the ecozoic, a seed is alive. Because we don't know what's sealed in it, it can contain any number of surprises. Everything the seed has needed is encoded within it. And as the world changes, it will discover everything it yet needs. That's the nature of adaptation and evolution, the two most important jobs we have on this planet, which is why I think seeds are the ultimate metaphor. Every morning I wake with fears and griefs. There are so many. I wake into the news of storms. When the storms have passed, what will we need to rebuild? We'll need seeds. There's at least one in each of you. There is a bank of seeds within you. Let them grow. I excused myself from a phone conversation the other day when I looked out the window and saw my husband trying to chase calves back into a pasture. They had been separated during the day so that Raven could milk in the evening and they wanted to get back to their moms. I got a skedaddle, I told my friend. The calves are out. I read this quote once, he replied, that anyone who keeps animals will soon become slave to them. He elongated the word slave. I'm not a quick thinker, and I was outside hollering like a banshee when I fabricated a witty retort. Anyone who does not keep animals will become slave to corporations. The same with farming. Anyone who does not grow food or know the grower of food will become a slave. Agriculture has created in us a story-based, community-reliant, land-loving people. It's given us a head start on what I call the age of bells, a time when bells, cow bells, dinner bells, the bells of flowers will again be ringing across the hills and plains. It also means that we're on an edge. Lots of edges. When I think of the edge, I think first of that literal one, the fence row, which modern chemical ag has been destroying, the place where birds pooped out 
wild cherry seeds and wild cherry trees grew. The place where tired from the row, workers sat in the shade and told stories. We occupy an edge between forest and field, the most exciting place in the world to me. We're on the edge of balancing, balancing the needs of the wild with the need to, to nourish people, balancing urban life with the need to eat, concerns about human health with the need for productivity, input against output, making decisions based on both ecology and economy. There's also a psychological edge we're all living on. We know that we're living in a world being devastated, but also one replete with the beauty and power of life. We live on the boundary of deciding to make positive contributions, although we know we are implicit in the destruction. We skate between apathy, because the truth of what's happening is painful, versus action, any kind of action. And we skitter between the paralysis caused by grief and fear versus action. Every decision that we have to make, whether it's life-sustaining or life-destroying, is an edge. Our very psyches are on the edge between dropping out and dropping in, selling out and fighting back. Every single one of us. The Verge is a dangerous, frightening place. It's important to know that one is not alone on it. The edge holds a tremendous ecological, cultural, as well as intellectual power. I believe that we have to get comfortable with it. How shall we live? As if we believe in the future. As if every one of us is a seed, which as you know is a sacred thing. One weekend in a storytelling workshop, I asked participants to tell stories of hope. One man told about stopping on Highway 441 near Franklin, North Carolina to rescue a box turtle only a foot from the yellow line. Mm -hmm. When he got back, he had to go up and turn around. And when he got back to the turtle, a white van had stopped in the suicide lane and successfully rescued the reptile. I'm not the only one, the man thought. Another story was about a professor's children who were visiting their dad on campus when they decided to make a sign. Students, stop walking around doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> they decorated the sign with peace signs and pictures of the earth. I want to say that these stories seem small compared to the enormity of the problems. Gandhi, however, pointed out that big problems need small solutions. Big problems need one courageous, willing person. Big problems need you doing what you desire to do and doing it with great authority, great knowledge, great love. Maybe, just maybe, once you have picked up a tool, someone will say of you, she's gone in search of the fabulous birds of the sea. After talks, I've been asked a hundred times, am I hopeful? How do I find hope? Do I stay hopeful? How? The assumption is that hope is a prerequisite for action. Without hope, one becomes depressed and unable to act. So I, I, for many years, tried to say that I find hope in nature. And not long ago, somebody asked me again, are you hopeful? And I suddenly realized, hope? Who needs hope? Do you feed your daughter or your, your son because you have hope she'll turn out OK? Hope is important to me, but I want to stress that I do not act because of hope. I act whether I have hope or not. That's mine. <laughs> I'm supposed to be chelating, and I missed my last one, which means I'm done till the next session, sadly. But that means my little girl, at this very moment, is taking a low dose of ALA to transport mercury out of her body. Mm -hmm. Do you feed her because you have hope she'll turn out okay? I act whether I have hope or not. It's useless to rely on hope as motivation to do what's necessary and just and right. Why doesn't anybody ever talk about love as motivation? So the question, how do I stay hopeful, becomes really as ludicrous as how do I stay love-filled? How? I'll tell you. I wake every morning listening to the great crested flycatcher call from the pear tree 
and I watched that fat old orange sun always burning rise flamboyantly over the pecan orchard. I watched green glazed collards go to seed. I watched hummingbirds and <coughs> red valentines of pigeon peas. Before bed, I walk outside and gaze up through the bare limbs of the swamp above Red Earth Farm, and I watch a meteor blaze a trail to Earth. I may not have a lot of hope, but I have plenty of love, which gives me five. We're going to have to fall in love with place again and learn how to stay put. We're going to have to learn courage, take action. We're going to have to fall in love with each other. We're going to have to ignore that good ideas have been marginalized and rush them back to the center of attention. Before I end with this last paragraph, thanks to Ben Jennings for inviting me to come. Thanks to uh, Donna Marie Emmer, uh, an old friend of mine, for, the, for our friendship and also for a, a beautiful introduction. Also, she's now the assistant um, seed librarian. So, yes. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Following Randy Smith. Yes. So thanks to all you guys who are seed savers and, and active in your library. Um, I believe under one roof you here, you have everything that we're going to need. So thank you for taking care of it. Thanks to Steve and Chris Lindemann, also old friends and a, one of, you know, just a beautiful place to stay when I get lucky enough to come to Abingdon. And then for the last time, thank you for giving up this afternoon and all the things that you could be doing in your lives, in your gardens, in your homes and kitchens to come be together and to think about these things. One night, I dreamed a marvelous dream. In it, I watched a man jump from a plane. A colorful parachute opened against a tie-dyed sky. The air swirled with starbursts, sundogs, spirals. Then I noticed a bicycle hanging from the parachute and I watched the man begin to pedal around through the universe. That was the totality of the dream, but when I awoke, I understood it to be a dream of possibility. We are leaping into the universe and not only will we be given a parachute to save ourselves, we will steer our course. I say it's the new moon. Plant intentions, don't burn them in a fire. Get really, really clear. It's going to be a powerful time. Sink into the place underground that seeds deserve. I say, rev up your awesome. Look around. So many people have put their shoulders into the load. You, find a place to push. Pick up a tool, a hoe, or a shovel. Start turning the compost to make the soil in which the seed will grow. You will begin at the center of many concentric circles that expand further and further out from you. You will become a local hero and a local rock star. And from there, your influence will wash outward even across the globe where so many people are rising up like germinating embryos to claim food sovereignty, to rescue local seeds, and to guard human civilization's cornucopia. Come home. Have the courage to live the life you dream. There's nothing greater. Many of our seeds have been lost forever, but we can protect what's left. And in our revolutionary gardens, we can develop the heirlooms of the future. Begin now. Are you going to farm her up or just lay there and bleed? <laughs>